Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Many young girls dreamt of success on Broadway, but Alice Fay not only attained it, she eclipsed that triumph by also becoming a beloved star of the silver screen. Through a combination of talent, timing and good luck, Fay was able to launch her stage career while still a teenager, demonstrating considerable ability as both a dancer and a singer. Why Alice Fay walked away from the biggest stardom. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Alice Fay's Life Beyond the Silver Screen Alice Fay's sweet demeanour, sultry glances and velvety voice were her signatures. Her haunting rendition of You'll Never Know has never been surpassed by any other singer. Fans adored her in such films as Alexander's Ragtime Band, Rose of Washington Square, Tin Pan Alley and Hello Frisco Hello. Alice Fay, one of the few movie stars to walk away from stardom at the peak of her career. She began her career as a chorus girl in vaudeville before being cast in a featured role in the 1931 Broadway production of George White's Scandals. Her appearances on radio with singing star Rudy Vallée led to a role in the film musical. The head of Fox Studios, Darrell F. Zanuck, was impressed with Alice's performance in that film and offered her a contract with the studio. By 1939, Alice was named one of the top ten box office names in Hollywood and became one of 20th Century Fox's most popular stars, appearing in a string of successful musicals. During the 1930s and early 1940s, as actress-singer, she was one of 20th Century Fox's most bankable attractions, starring in box office vehicles. By 1945, however, Alice earned the distinction of being one of the few silver screen stars to abandon stardom at the peak of her career, choosing instead to focus on being both wife to husband Phil Harris and mother to their two daughters, Phyllis and Alice. Since performing is not always easy to walk away from, Faye found fulfilment in appearing alongside Phil in one of radio's funniest situation comedies, The Phil Harris Alice Faye Show. So many personalities we learn about when we look at the entertainment industry wind up being tales of tragedy. This is particularly ironic because so many dream of going into show business as a means of finding lasting happiness. That it is so elusive is a comment on both the demands of stardom and the frailty of dreams. With this in mind, it is somewhat of a relief when we learn about someone who endured the struggles and trials necessary to achieve Hollywood stardom and still found happiness, even when they discovered that being happy was ultimately more satisfying than being a star and essentially walked away from stardom. Alice Jean Leppert was the daughter of a New York City cop growing up on the mean streets of Manhattan's Hell's Kitchen and his Irish-American wife, Alice Leppert. She was raised an Episcopalian. Little Alice was quick to realise that the singing and dancing that she enjoyed so much not only brought joy to others, it could be her ticket to a better life. She rose from the mean streets of New York's Hell's Kitchen to become the most famous singing actress in the world. When the pressures of fame became too much, she had the courage to leave Hollywood on her own terms. She joined a vaudeville troupe at about the age of 13. Alice's actual age is often disputed, records are inconclusive, and she often lied about her age early in her career because producers thought she was too young. She was still a teenager when she adopted her stage name of Alice Fay because she thought it might nudge her along towards success and landed a role in the chorus of the Broadway review Scandals of 1931. The show starred Ethel Merman, Roy Bolger and radio's Rudy Valley. Valley heard Alice sing at a party and hired her to appear on the Fleischmann Hour. A peaches and cream complexion, a knockout figure and a throaty voice all combined to carry Alice Fay to the pinnacle of Hollywood stardom in the 1930s. When Hollywood decided to make Scandals into a film, Valet insisted that his protégé be included in the cast to sing a single song. When the film's star Lillian Harvey abandoned the project, 
Alice wound up as the picture's leading lady. It was not long before she was one of Hollywood's top stars. She became a hit with film audiences of the 1930s, particularly when Fox production head Darrell F. Zanuck made her his protégé. Faye also received a physical makeover, going from a version of Jean Harlow to a wholesome appearance, in which her pencil line eyebrows were swapped for a more natural look. Actual scandal touched the project when Valet's wife sued for divorce and named Alice as party to the complaint. Rudy Valet had a reputation for wandering affections, but Alice Fay denied that the affair took place. The scandal was not enough to divert the attention of Fox Studios' Darrell F. Zanuck, who orchestrated a makeover for Miss Fay to make her a more profitable property for the studio. First came a shift from roles as a smart-mouthed chorus girl to a youthful yet motherly figure. She played Shirley Temple's mother in a few Fox musicals, and the studio also took advantage of her good looks by turning her into their own singing version of Jean Harlow, with a platinum dye job and plucked eyebrows. Zanuck's attention was not always a happy experience for Alice, but it was a steady road to stardom. She won the female lead for In Old Chicago and sang a song for the sons of Mrs. O'Leary, played by Donna Meche and Tyrone Power. Zanuck initially resisted casting Faye as the role had been written for Jean Harlow. However, critics applauded Faye's performance. The film was extremely memorable for its 20-minute ending, a recreation of the Great Chicago Fire, a scene so dangerous that women, except for the main stars, were banned from the set. Her co-stars in that film were Tyrone Power and Donna Mechie, two of Faye's most frequent co-stars, as it was customary for studios to pair its contract players together in more than one film. The trio next appeared together in Alexander's Ragtime Band, which was designed as a showcase for Irving Berlin tunes. Alice received strong reviews and became an established star for Fox. One of the most expensive films of its time, it also became one of the most successful musicals of the 1930s. Because of her bankable status, Fox occasionally placed Faye in films that were put together more for the sake of making money than showcasing Faye's talents. Films like Tailspin and Barricade were more dramatic in nature than regular Faye films and often did not contain any songs, but due to her immense popularity, none of the films that she made in the 1930s and 1940s lost money. The Fox PR department was not above stirring up flames by creating a supposed rivalry between Alice and rising star Betty Grable. Grable had starred in Down Argentine Way, a role that Alice had to turn down due to illness. The rivalry supposedly flared as both ladies were cast in Tin Pan Alley, where in fact they were close friends and got along famously during production. Alice was becoming more disillusioned with Zanuck and the Fox Machine. However, she was distracted by a new love in her life. Jazz man turned funny man Phil Harris seemed an unlikely match for the lovely Alice Fay, but it was very much a storybook relationship. Harris had taken a cue from his boss, Jack Benny, and created a radio persona which was miles away from his real-life personality. Benny was self-centred and stingy on the radio, while in real life he was known to be generous and warm. His musical director, Harris, was supposedly a loud-mouthed braggart who never saw a mirror, bottle or pretty girl that he wasn't determined to get closer to. When he wasn't performing, Phil was actually incredibly loyal and down-to-earth. However, in 1938, he did get in a fist fight at the Trocadero Club when he came to Alice's defence after her romance with producer Bob Stevens ended. Although a serious romance was outside of Phil Harris's playboy character, Benny decided to make comic hay over Phil and Alice's marriage in 1941. Phil and his whole band joined the Navy in 1942, and after their daughters were born, Alice renegotiated her contract with Fox, so that she was only obligated to make one picture a year. The last of them was Fallen Angel, in which Zanuck had insisted that several of Alice's scenes be edited to place more attention on his new star protégé, Linda Darnell. 
She was cast in three or four movies a year until 1945 when she made Fallen Angel and decided she had had enough. In the meantime, she was married for three years to Tony Martin and in 1941 married band leader Phil Harris. It is a marriage that has lasted for 51 years. After watching a screening of the final cut, Alice packed her things at the studio and drove off the lot, leaving her dressing room keys with the guard as she went through the gate, never to return. Her contract committed her to at least two more pictures, so Zanuck had her blackballed from pictures for breach of contract. Not that Alice was particularly upset to be out of work. Raising her daughters and actually managing a household was a new and more satisfying challenge. She was the honest, good-hearted girl who stood by her man, and when that man did her wrong, her response was to sing a torch song and love him harder. Off-screen she had an unlikely but happy marriage to Phil. After Phil finished his military service, he continued to work for his old boss, Jack Benny. By now he was considered an elder statesman of jazz, so he and Alice were tapped to host the Fitch bandwagon. Although Fitch Bandwagon was sold as a showcase for jazz bands, the sketches between the married couple were the real hit of the show. Faye was back before the cameras briefly in 1962 to make State Fair with Pat Boone, a movie she has indicated she would prefer to forget. She and her husband starred for eight years on their own radio programme, the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show with the content centred around their family life and two children, Phyllis and Alice Jr. Faye played herself, a film star who had forsaken the fame and glory of the silver screen for life as a wife and mother. The show was last aired in 1954. The show was centred on a hard-working show-business couple raising a pair of precocious daughters. Harris refined his jive-talking character from the Benny programme, now a responsible father, he kept a good deal of the vanity and added a penchant for dunderheaded schemes that his tart but loving wife had to rescue him from. Harris's character was six parts Gracie Allen and half a dozen parts Yogi Berra. The real Harris girls were too young to participate, so they were played by Janine Ruse and Anne Whitfield. Lovable blowhard Gail Gordon became the sponsor's rep and the butt of many jokes on the Jack Benny programme. Guitar player Frank Remley became Phil's sidekick. The real Frank Remley was an important part of Harris's band, but he didn't want to act on the radio, so he was played by Elliot Lewis. Child impersonator Walter Tetley from The Great Gildersleeve played the fresh-mouthed delivery boy Julius. Julius's running gag was getting the best of Harris while maintaining a crush on Alice. Each episode featured a musical interlude from each of the stars. The real strength of the show was the obvious affection that the leading couple had for each other. Their marriage, the second for both, lasted 54 years until Phil passed away. The couple continued with their individual projects as well. Phil was introduced to a whole new generation of fans through his voice work in Disney films like The Jungle Book, The Aristocats and Robin Hood. Alice came out of retirement again in 1974 to go back on the stage with the show Good News, playing opposite John Payne on Broadway and Don Amici on tour. I had a wonderful time, she said. It was hard work but fun, and I was with it for two years, including a year of touring. Then in 1983 she took on still another role, this time touring as an ambassador for good health for Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. I travelled with a doctor, she said, and he would talk to the young elders, as I call them, about medications, etc. Then we showed a film I had made for Pfizer, we still are, that was about an hour long. Then he introduced me, and I came out and talked about taking care of ourselves and staying active and involved. After that, Faye said she took questions and signed autographs, and the talk quickly turned from health matters to show business. Usually they wanted to know what it felt like to kiss Tyrone Power or about my costumes. But her association with Pfizer ended after eight years. Somebody up there put their foot down about celebrities travelling for pharmaceutical companies, she said. It was too bad. I think we did a lot of good, and I really enjoyed it. That didn't mean an end to her exercise programme at home, however. I exercise three times a week, said Faye although she says she dropped swimming 
because it turned cold, but I do the best I can. Along with exercise, Faye said she got plenty of other activity. I just did a documentary on Shirley Temple, she said, but other than little things like that, I spent my time running my home, doing marketing, all those things, and I do all my own mail. She said she still receives a lot of fan mail. Much of it has been coming from England, and recently I've been getting a lot from Germany and France, she said. I guess they must be releasing my films over there, and the movie buffs want signed pictures. I'm very thrilled with it. She said she doesn't know how fans so far away find her in Palm Springs. I think they must have little pipelines to one another, she said, but somehow they find these addresses. The two daughters of Alice Fay and Phil Harris, one in New Orleans and the other in Rancho Mirage, California, have given them four grandchildren, and Alice's son and his wife had a baby, so we're great-grandma and great-grandpa, she said. As for her movies, Alice Fay says she doesn't watch them, except on rare occasions, when I get caught. But if she were to watch, she listed her favourites as Alexander's Ragtime Band in Old Chicago, Hello Frisco Hello, and Hollywood Cavalcade. But I love them all, she said. And do the grandchildren like to watch Grandma Alice on the screen? They're in another generation, she said. Their likes and dislikes are entirely different. But our grandson came over the other day to get some cassettes of my films. I guess he gets a kick out of them. But I don't push it. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Alice Fay said no more to Hollywood by herself, but not everyone was lucky enough to make their own decision. Why was Barbara Lamar banned from Los Angeles as a teen? Watch this video and find out.